You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Barbell Logic, Beast Overburden. You have two beasts here. Mm. Checking in. I'm Nikki Sims. And the I'm... other beast is Andrew Jackson. Oh, <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we'll figure this out someday. <laughs> All right. But today we have the real Andrew Jackson because last week That's right. we had a computer. I'm in location number three. I'm, I think, <laughs> 0 for 2 recording sessions of finding a room or audio setup that is adequate to our producer, Stephen. In fact, last two episodes, you weren't actually listening to me. Uh, It turns out that the HVAC in my garage is so bad that our (laughs) producer had to reconstruct my voice using AI. So if you hear me calling you that uh, you need to wire money to my account in Russia (laughs) in the next month, it's probably not actually me. It's that my voice is now in the AI ether. Yeah. So one step and closer all of to... the dialogue was Andrew, but we couldn't get That's a true. good sound yeah. out of it. I said those things. Those are my words. But the actual audio was reconstructed using AI technology. Which is so creepy. The creepiest because part... Because it sounded pretty good. Yeah. What got published was extremely good and real sounding. The creepy part is he had to go through and manually trim out these little idiosyncrasies that it stuck in in trying to interpret what I was saying. And so he's got, I have this like minute long compilation of all the I think he titled it like Nightmares or something. A minute of nightmares. AI nightmares. Yeah, so so that's fun. Mm, One step closer Mm -hmm. to the Skynet taking over. Yeah. Good kind of testament to it's worth knowing how to use AI. I mean, at the same time, though, certainly was a powerful tool. Otherwise, y'all would have been listening to (laughs) in the background for 30 minutes. So, you know, some silver linings to be. Producer has such a high level. Yeah. Yeah. He has a very high standard. So, anyways, trying to see if I can set a new bar here. I've laid carpet down, sound absorbing materials all around, and uh, cross your fingers. Yeah. Good job. The softest things I have to absorb sound are my dog who's laying on the floor (laughs) and my stomach. (laughs) (laughs) What has your stomach been doing for the last week? That got it to the state. It just is a stomach. It has organs in it. I thought I was going to segue into talking about the block party. Oh, no. No, no, no. But block party was great. Got some great calories. We had our annual staff conference, which we lovingly call block party. Got together and did some lifting events. That was really fun. We did max chin-ups, some grip test that was pretty humbling, and then a one arm deadlift, which Andrew here did you know, he likes to carve his own pathway here. So instead of, you know, doing normal one arms like everybody, he did a set of three at the top. And then for the main event, he took off almost all of his clothes and <laughs> pulled 540 pounds. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think it was 530. I thought it was 540, but I got mixed up because my program is written in kilos because I have kilos at the home gym. And it was 240 kilos, which is 530 pounds. So. Yeah, but still, that's the heaviest deadlift that I've done in a long time. Yeah, which we talked about on the previous episode. Yeah, so the triple was my program for the day. Coach gave me a triple at whatever it was. It would have been like 210, 210 kilos, so 450, something like that, or 60. And so I wanted to make sure I did my program. And then the event for the day was a 1RM. So did a couple other warm-up reps. And then I just wanted to get fired up and, you know, there were ammonia caps and my music. And you know, all coaches love when you're just like, hey, I just decided to do a heavy single today. Don't you still love me? Oh, yeah. He was fine. <laughs> he, I mean, afterwards, he was like, ah, I should have known. The camera knows. Yeah. He knew what we were going to be doing. So 
No, it was fun. all good. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, blog party was a blast. Good presentations. Really good to see everybody face to face. It was a blast. Yeah. But anyway, any hoot. Any hoot. On to the hoots. Your presentation kind of made me think of what I wanted to talk about today. I think that's where I got it. You bring this wonderful perspective to the team of the way you phrase it as eliminating waste, where you implement certain strategies, set up workspace, set up your screen, all these tools to help you provide the most value in an efficient way. And I know that's really important to a lot of our clients in the sense that their time is super, super important. And some of us don't get into training until we're in our 30s and 40s. So we're often wondering, like, how can I get the most out of my training now? And since I've spent a lot of time bumbling around, you know, going one way, learning something, going another way, learning something, I thought it'd be neat to talk about how you can invest in your training, meaning how you can reduce the amount of time spent getting around and <laughs> increase <laughs> the amount of value you can get out of your training. What do you think? I think that sounds good. I mean, I've thought a lot about time in terms of operational efficiency, as you're mentioning. And I've definitely invested in a lot of different things over my life that have had a really positive impact. So I think it's worth talking about how to invest your time or your resources into making training as productive as possible. I guess my first question to you is what, what do you think investing means? Like what is invest? What does it mean to invest? In that sense, or just in the word alone, it would be, in my opinion, like starting with something small and making it increase in value, increase in something when you start kind of small and then it grows. <laughs> Where you insert something that has value to you and then with the goal of getting something back that has more value than what you put into it. Mm, okay, that's interesting. I don't know. I didn't get that out of a dictionary. It's probably not a surprise. <laughs> I certainly think that that is a great way of describing the outcome of a good investment. Of a good investment, yeah. Yeah, I, of course, applied in thinking about this uh, subject beforehand, my engineering kind of brain where I deconstruct all the components and uh, started thinking about how I've invested in different things throughout my life. First off, I came up with a way of phrasing an investment that made sense to me, which is committing, making a commitment of either time and or money or some combination of time and money being the measure of an investment into something. And I use the word commitment very specifically because a commitment, you cannot know commitment without knowing a sacrifice. So you are sacrificing something, either time and or money, into some sort of endeavor or activity or thing that ideally a good investment returns some amplification of or some, actually, I would maybe rephrase it as some change for the better, which I think is a version of what you were kind of describing, that you put a little in and you get a lot out. I think, however, you can have a bad investment. You can also commit resources or sacrifice time and or money towards something, and it gets smaller or you know return a negative change. It can be a change for the not better. So I only think that's important because... Defining terms to me is useful because it allows at least me to be more intentional about why I'm doing or what expectations I have for, in this case, like I'm saying, I'm having to make an intentional sacrifice with my time. And we talk about using you need a budget often to give every dollar a job. And I think investments are a process of giving time and your money, in many cases, a job in the hopes of getting something to grow or change for the better out of it. Does that make sense? I love that. And it made me think of a quote, which I heard recently, which you might have been the one who told me, but we can get more money. We can find ways to get more money, but we can't find ways to get more time. Right. And so those two kind of inputs into this investment are significant you know, at various points of our lives, we'll have more time to play with and at others, we'll have more money to play with than time. 
and you're never going to get more time really out of your investment, but it can be a bigger impact yeah. to your time. Yeah, exactly. I think that money can be a force multiplier, if you will, for your time. So the first example that popped up in my mind was education. And I think the same can be said for coaching is that if there's a particular skill that you want to learn, theoretically, you could, especially now, teach yourself or learn whatever that skill is. And in many skills, that's a wonderful investment of your time to teach yourself how to do something. But you can force multiply that investment of time with additional money, investing that into having a coach or a teacher or a guide, which will enable you to get the same change for the better outcome in terms of learning whatever skill that is that you're pursuing in ideally, if it's a good investment, a fraction of the time. And I would argue that's the same argument for investing in a coach is that there is enough information theoretically on the internet for anybody to go and learn how to train effectively and they can teach themselves and learn through the school of hard knocks how to recover from all the different things that you encounter over the course of years and decades of training. Or you can hire a coach that has been through the process that you're intending to go through and get through each of those sticking points faster with probably less derailing events, ideally fewer injuries or faster recovery from the injuries when they do come up. Right. So I think the process of investment, and that's why I was so clear about defining that time and or money aspect of it is because I think that you can be intentional about not only what to invest in, but how to go about investing in it based on, like you said, at this point in my life, do I have more time or do I have more money and how do I go get more money? Because like you said, or pull money from other areas of life because you can't manufacture more time. Yeah. I like how you pose that as education because when you learn more from someone or when you teach yourself, you're adding more color and more robustness to the experience itself. And it makes me think that you're going to get, if it's a positive change or a negative change, you're going to experience emotions throughout your investment. But depending on how you look at it, you're adding more and more and more to the experience in a really cool way. And if you have that mindset of growth and the mindset of curiosity, if it's positive change or negative change, you're learning something. And that's where a lot of coaches have learned is we learn through a lot of like negative changes <laughs> in our history. And that's what we get to apply when we work with other clients, because when you're just working for yourself, you have, you know, N equals one. But when you've gotten to work with hundreds of people, you know, that sample size is huge. So all of the negative changes you've experienced give you such a big, big, colorful, just deep knowledge of this process that you can reap the benefit of as a client. <laughs> totally. I mean, you're, I think one of the interesting things about talking about the value of what we provide as coaching, I think it's sometimes common to hear, and I have to remind myself of this as well, when I'm looking at towards what do I want to invest in or how do I want to identify somebody who, you know, I want to invest in helping me, that there's a tendency to look at the commitment in terms of the dollar per hour. You know, how much am I paying for hour of this person's time or two hours or whatever it might be? What you're actually paying for, though, to your point, is all of the time, all of the education, all the experiences that went into that coaches or that professional's perspective, their wisdom, the color of that they're able to see 10, 5, 10, 15 years of experience is being brought to that hour. That's what I think of, or at least what I try to coach myself to think about when I'm paying for a professional, whether it's putting drywall up or laying floor down. There's a famous quote out there, you know, the, you don't appreciate the value of a professional until you experience being an amateur, something to that effect which is a big reason why I actually, my favorite clients are the ones who've actually tried to coach themselves for a while because they have gone through the LP or, you know, some a number of months of suffering and being stuck and frustrated and are able to appreciate 
when I'm able to help them get unstuck and immediately start making progress for the next six to 12 to 18 months. They're like, oh my God, how was this possible? I was completely stuck and I thought I was done making progress. Yeah. But then you can bring that wisdom in. It's eliminating the stuck point. Exactly. Yeah. Just getting you through those so much quicker. Or as much as you can. So I think we both are pretty bought into coaching. We see the value <laughs> of coaching. <laughs> Am I selling that too hard? Yeah. <laughs> I know all of our listeners are like, yeah, we know. Uh, <laughs> what's something else that you think is a worthwhile investment? Well, I also deconstructed this, thought a lot about it, and I came up with eight major elements of life that I think are important to invest in and to varying degrees throughout life. And in somewhat of a particular order, it's not perfect, but I think directionally correct. Number one is things that help you become better at using your mind. Real simple example would be reading, writing, arithmetic growing up. I would put meditation in this category, learning how to focus your mind, direct your mind, anything where you're learning how to leverage your mind to help you do what you want to do. If you lose your mind, you're gonna have a hard time doing anything in life. And even as much as we value putting a priority on your physical health, Stephen Hawkins still did a ton of really great things in his life because he still had his mental faculties even when he didn't have his body. Two, I would put his physical health. So investing in time and energy into taking care of your body, both you know, physical activity and nutrition. Three, I think is emotional, learning how to understand and kind of deal with your emotions. So in my case, I invested for many, many years in having a therapist, for lack of a better word, or a coach, the emotional coach that helped me reflect on, pay attention, observe, and, and kind of deal with my emotions. And I've had a couple of different ones at different times in my life that did a lot of what you just described. They were able to help me step back and kind of evaluate my emotions from a different perspective with a much better palette of information and wisdom. Fourth, I would say is relational components of your life. So your ability to relate with other people, build good relationships. It's interesting, I was just listening to the 1938 Harvard study where they tracked a population of 700 and some men throughout the last 85 years. And the number one thing that they found that influenced the quality of life was the quality of their relationships. And certainly coming out of COVID, I think we've all experienced that being cut off from relationships has a detrimental effect on our quality of life. Five, I would say, is when you start talking about finances. Initially, a good example of something I've invested in to help me manage my personal finances, you need a budget. And we actually did a poll in Slack where YNAB came up a bunch as one of those investments that people just would not live without. Beyond that personal budget, and then there's also leveraging your money I think in terms of investing. I would also put your professional development in one of those categories, like things that help you learn how to add more value to the world in a way that you can be compensated for it. Six, I would put philosophy and or spiritual slash religious investment of time or money into those questions in life, those eternal truths or infinitely true things, pursuing kind of that aspect of life. And the last one that I would add in there is an artistic expression. I think there's a part of everybody or any human that craves creating and being able to express that aspect of creating. It's some people it's in business. Like right now, I find developing an app to be an artistic expression, but it could be music, could be drawing, things like that. So I know that was a bit of a detour, a bit of a journey. But again, my brain is just wanting to like bucketize, organize, deconstruct things. But those were the eight major categories that where I have concrete examples of sacrificing money or time with the intention of getting a change for the better. I love that. I like how they're all pretty diverse, like they're not overlapping. How about you? Well, I thought specifically investing in training. Yes. I didn't go to that meta level. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go through my training list. <laughs> One of them was a coach because like we talked about, it can really help you get to where you want to be quite a bit sooner. But before that, I think it's really worth investing in figuring out what's important to you. 
figuring out your whys. Because if you're not clear on that, you spend a lot of time chasing a hundred different things instead of putting, you know, everything into one direction. And also comes with that, knowing that that can change, but the ability to kind of sit. And I think this speaks to your, um, what you mentioned in your ability to meditate, being able to hear what's important to yourself. And once you have that established, then it's even easier to find a coach because you know exactly what you want to get out of it. The other thing that came to mind was training equipment. Building a home gym just totally makes getting to your training so much faster. You don't have to wait for the squat rack to open up, use a crappy barbell, bring your own fractional place to the gym, deal with traffic. You can add on to your gym as much as you need to. And it becomes your own space where you can make it somewhere you really, really, really want to be. I think we both know the value of having a gorgeous home gym. <laughs> but I still like to go to, I call it the Globo Gym down the street because I get to walk there. I get to be around people. I get to see what everybody else is doing. I totally feed off of that bro energy. I love it. <laughs> like, so that's still an, an investment for me because it keeps me really excited about training. But equipment, I think, is a really big one. And when you're clear on your goals, it makes it a lot easier to know how to outfit your gym too. Have you ever had uh, an investment in that category where you struggled to pull the trigger? In the gym? Yeah. You wanted it, but it didn't cross the threshold of being enough of a return to justify the sacrifice? I think for me, like one that comes up as a deadlift bar where it was like, oh, that would have been so fun. But it was kind of easy to talk myself out of. I didn't have any like meets coming up or anything. And I'm kind of glad I didn't get one because I haven't competed in ages. <laughs> but something like the monoliths, which one of the best things ever, that added so much value to my training because you can train on your own, saves your shoulders. It's just a dream like that is an instant improvement. The monoliths are a really good one. And then I've gotten to use your loadable dumbbells. And I think those are really diverse. You can do so much with them. You really almost double the size of your gym with a set of loadable dumbbells. Yeah, I have the micro gains loadable dumbbells and I really enjoy it. I'm torn about whether to go to the next level of having one of those selectorized style like Matt does the power block because it's just so fast to get between the weights. And yeah, totally. The one drawback I would say of the loadable is that it's, you know, a little bit of a... It's a lot of loading. ...hassle to load and load and unload the dumbbells. But it's definitely been... It's helped expand the number of exercises I can do, for sure. I would say I use it multiple times a week, for sure. Another one for me, this I kind of came to you recently, is having a doctor or a PT that you can rely on. I realized that I was spending a lot of time being kind of frustrated and evasive around the back thing I was dealing with and now with the shoulder thing that's been pretty persistent. A lot of the reason I didn't want to go see a doctor was one, the cost of like getting an MRI and whatever. And then I had the assumption that they were going to tell me to stop doing what I liked doing or I was going to feel really limited in my training all of a sudden. Maybe I was going to have to get surgery, but I just assumed that I wasn't going to trust this person. And I was like, well, what if I found somebody who I did trust? That probably would have saved me a bunch of time and my coaches through all that saga a bunch of time too. So I can see having a doctor and or a PT that you can really rely on who's really invested in the same things you are be such a great thing to find and be able to support financially. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And it kind of connects back to what I was kind of poking at was the question about feeling hesitant to, or is there something you haven't pulled the trigger on? And I think it's, <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to find a good investment. Sometimes you have to do a lot of homework and qualify the investment. And I think that's a big component to the resistance that comes up. How do you know it's a good investment? How do you build that trust? How do you get that feeling of hell yes when it, it's so easy to say no? And especially the bigger the investment gets or the bigger the sacrifice <laughs> required, the harder it is to feel that hell yes because you don't know what's on the other side. Even as something as relatively trivial as like I went shopping for an e-bike recently 
And it was so frustrating because while going through the process of shopping, looking for the hell yeah, I was starting to accumulate guilt for spending the time on that process because the more time I spent, the more it was almost like a cost fallacy where I was starting to feel like this time is wasted because I still haven't made a purchase. And so I would just feel like even more and more pressure to make a decision, even though I hadn't found the thing that I wanted yet, <laughs> which that sounds trivial, but I think that's one of the hardest parts of making any investment is trying to figure out how to listen to your intuition while still pushing towards some decision at some point and figuring out how to invest at a level that you might lose. Like, I mean, that's where it gets, it gets into kind of a gamble. At some point, you're having to invest something or sacrifice some amount of time or money, and you might not know whether you get the return for some unknown period of time in the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you, like with this doctor choice, that like, this is new, right? That you're kind of pursuing that? Yeah, it happened because I had a bench press day and I had like a couple reps and my shoulder just totally got lit up. And it's at this weight that used to be a breeze of a warm up. And now I can't even bench 135 without my shoulder getting just totally lit up. And I was tired of being tired of it. So it's like, okay, time for me to just get this sorted out. So anyway, it was actually pretty easy to find sports medicine doctors and I'm going to go see one <laughs> like next week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. so, okay. So that's another, that's an interesting, as another angle to it maybe is that sometimes the resistance is that it's a lot of effort to figure out whether it's a good investment. Sometimes there's not enough pain to motivate action something or i was just too <laughs> deep in it and i've gotten so used to feeling good while i'm training now like Ooh. it's different so it just snapped you out of it i spent a lot of time just being like well this is how it is now. you need to be in pain and now i'm just like no way that hurt ouch i don't want to deal with that again <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and also i don't know if anybody can relate but just figuring out health insurance and uh, yeah. which doctors accept what. Just, yeah. I hate dealing with it. Yeah. But I also hated being kept up all night from my shoulder. So, drew the line. And anyway, we'll see if we can find a good kind of teammate in that realm. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Going back to what you're saying, you don't always know if the energy that you spend is going to be worth it in the end. But if you're a glass half full kind of person, you'll be like, well, that was a neat experience and I got this out of it. And if you're just a fear-based grumpy person i don't really want to go shopping with someone like that <laughs> yeah to be resentful kind of yeah you never know you don't but i do think that to your point understanding your why being clear and that's why i i mean again i know it's probably sounded like i was rambling a lot but being intentional about what it is that you're sacrificing your time for what the expectation is i think being clear on that is as important as the rest of the process, because then you know why you're sacrificing your time and you're making a conscious choice to give that time or money a job towards one of those aspects of your life that you're being intentional about. And like you said, either you will benefit from that return or you'll learn from the choice and you can own that choice. And to me, that's important because a lot of times I'll hear myself saying, I don't have the time or I don't have the money to do X. But that's not true. It's that I haven't taken ownership of putting the time and money into the thing that I value. And instead, my time and money are being consumed by some other thing that I've let consume that resource. So you can phrase it differently. I can take more ownership and phrase it as, no, it's not that I don't have time or money. It's that I've allocated that time and money to this other thing. Huh, that's interesting. There's a whole bunch of time and money that doesn't fit into one of those eight important aspects of my life. Maybe I should YNAB some of that time and money <laughs> over here, <laughs> stop complaining that I don't have time to do it and go make that happen. But anyways, that's, that's my internal soapbox to myself that I keep running into. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like realizing that stuff because you end up being more honest with yourself and with people. Exactly. When you're like, oh, I really wish I could be there, but I can't. 
when right actually you made other choices you might could have been there but you chose to be where you are and so right like you and I stopped saying I wish I could right. because we were at some point like, well, we thought about that, but then we decided not to. That's right. So nope. that's fine. <laughs> you don't wish you could. You actually chose not to. <laughs> right. <laughs> so deal with it, Andrew. <laughs> Suck it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But yeah, the last thing that I think is worth investing in is sleep. Mm. I think it's because I'm just so sensitive to not sleeping very well anymore that doing whatever you got to do to get a good night's sleep makes everything so much better. Makes your day better, makes your relational investments better, makes my appetite a lot more reliable, skin looks better, everything. <laughs> and you have to really like strategize that. It's not something that right. you can just like flighty succeed in. Like when you're busy and right. over 25, you have to like really try. Thinking about those categories again too, I think is a way to evaluate the quality of your investment in terms of how many of those they can touch. And sleep is going to probably influence all eight of those aspects of my life. <laughs> Certainly if I'm not getting good sleep, my brain stops working, my body doesn't perform as well, my emotional regulation is gonna be off, my relationship quality is gonna be is going to suffer. My professional life is going to suffer. My financial life is therefore then going to suffer. Like you just go down the list. So that is a good example, along with training as an activity is going to positively influence a lot of those categories. So thinking about, are you getting that growing of whatever it is or change for the better as you put in the little relative amount of time or money? And then also how many different aspects of your life does it positively influence? I think is another good way of evaluating the quality of an investment. I like that. I think that's a really good framework to try out where you can, I like your eight, which I think was eight to 10. It was eight things. I can list eight. Some of them were slashes. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Because I, and I did no, that intentionally. Some people would put spirituality as the category, but I would also say some people lean a little bit more into perhaps philosophy or philosophical, but I think they kind of hit the same note of those eternal truths. Totally. There being something more than just what's going on in our own heads. Yes. But there are definitely, there were eight. There were eight there. We'll go back in the replay. Okay. <laughs> it's, that's fine. I don't need to be right about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully when you're listening to this, you can think of things that you don't really want to waste your time on anymore, or you have maybe your own list of eight, or you want to work off of what we've given you. But I think you'll know when you've hit something and it feels worth it because things feel a little bit easier and they feel almost more worth it. The value, like the difficulty is in the right place. It doesn't feel easy all the time. I mean, some of my best investments have been the hardest. I mean, we, and we talk about, or at least Matt talks a lot about voluntary hardship. And I would say I seek things that feel hard if I were to try to categorize it, I would say that things that feel like a good investment are when I can experience a positive impact in the quality of my life over a very long period of time. So things that are either an experience that changes me physically, mentally, emotionally for the better, or that I can reflect on at some point and recognize that it did. I mean, interestingly, would categorize rowing in the military in that kind of bucket where I would not want to do four years on a college rowing team ever again in my life. <laughs> and for many, many hours sitting on the erg, it was a miserable experience. And yet I can easily look back and see that time as one of the best investments I've ever made in my life. And the military, I wish I had a better attitude about it while I was in because I think I would have experienced it better, but I was really unhappy <laughs> in the military and yet look back at that six years and probably see it as probably the most important investment of time that I made in my life in terms of how much it still benefits me to this day to have gone through that. So sometimes I think it's really hard to know whether it's a, a good investment until even years later when you've got a different perspective on, on your life. So 
<laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but. No, I like it. It's the mindset of seeing what you got out of it. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, yeah, you're able to see what the values were, even if it didn't feel wonderful at the time. Thank you for this philosophy corner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Things my brain spins on at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> staring at the ceiling and listening to the people screaming outside. I don't know why there's people screaming outside, but it might be because I'm in a hotel room that's in the basement right next to an alley. I in don't the know. middle of downtown Springfield. In downtown yeah. Springfield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining these two beasts in the cave of thought. And if you enjoyed this, hopefully you did. Let us know. Give us a review and send us an email with literally anything. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.